It's another exciting edition of Hall of Fame right here on City TV. My name is AJ Akwako Sapon. It's an absolute pleasure to be on your TV screens, bringing you the show that gets up close and candid with some of your favorite personalities. Today is no exception. And for the next 60 minutes, I encourage you to stay with us and enjoy this very exciting conversation coming your way. We'll take a quick break. When I come back, I'll tell you all about my guest and get into the conversation. This is Hall of Fame right here on City TV. You're tuned into the Hall of Fame right here on City TV with your truly AJ Sapon. And my guest today is someone I'm really excited to have a conversation with. I first, um, well, obviously, I grew up watching him, and I first caught a glimpse of him in uh, an episode of a show he was shooting in the town I was at a particular point in time. But unfortunately, the rains came down so bad that he couldn't actually shoot that show on that particular day. And I have been looking forward to the day that I would get an opportunity to actually sit down and have a conversation with him. And today I'm blessed to do so. He's an ace actor who has uh, been one of the pioneering people behind the movie industry we see now today here in Ghana. He has done so much, uh, gotten the accolades that he absolutely deserves, and today he will tell me how all that came to be. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest today is none other than the man, David Donta. It's so exciting to meet you here. Thank you. Uh, so the, the, the occasion I was talking about is um, an episode of Agro that you're supposed to shoot in Agogo. That's right. And that particular night, the rain came down so much I that we, I, I couldn't, we didn't end up getting to see you. But it's such a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. And I'd like us to start all the way to, or from the beginning. And I'd like to ask, is acting something that you found? Did it find you? Did you fall into it? Describe how you decided that or describe how acting in general found you. I was born into it. Okay. Um, I had an uncle who was... Uh, a very good actor. Unfortunately, the, f the family did not allow him wow. and drank himself to death uh, because uh, they didn't allow him to experience his first love of life. He was a singer, he was a dancer, he was an actor. Wow. Very. We are not good. Fantastic, if I wow. say fantastic. Um, he uh, was uh, doing something with... Uh, Happy stars, and then later on came to sing um, the song, Madame Fufa Beko. He actually sang the alto oh, on it. Okay. And he was also a lady impersonator. If he dresses up as a woman, you would you, you would not be able to tell wow. the difference between a, a man and a woman. And uh, the family did not want because they said, "Oh, oh, okay, concert," so they stopped him, and that actually got on him. And he virtually drank himself to death. So that's when you decided. That's, um, that's uh, and I lived with him, you know. So I picked a few things from him. But even before that, I had lived in a huge family house in Cape Coast, where I was born. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps every human being was in the house. We had doctors, we had engineers, we had mechanics, fishermen, fishmongers, traders, teachers, you name them. And these were people who were living with their families, mm. a family of about 30 plus people. And that was where, those were times when kids would eat from a common bowl, play together, do all kinds of things together. And I guess that's where I picked a lot of my clues, so to speak, in acting. Mm. And so when the opportunity presented itself for me to start acting, I realized that I had everything <laughs> to act. So. That is how I fell into it, and I was hugely comfortable acting. Now, describe growing up in that particular uh, area. With your family system, with having an uncle that their vision was not supported to be an actor, how did your family react to you saying you wanted to go into acting? Oh, very interesting. <laughs> my, my own father did not speak to me for two years. Wow. When he saw me an advert on television and was wondering. Okay. Are you acting as a yes? And he couldn't believe that I wanted to act because I did science, chemistry, physics, biology, mathematics, and this form to go and do medicine. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, those were times when it was so difficult entering medical school. I couldn't get all the grades to go to medical school. 
So I went with my father, I went with my auntie, I went with USAID and all those, you know, doing kinds of all kinds of odd jobs. And then the USAID director at that time, you know, my auntie was doing um, rural development project for USAID. Mm -hmm. And I designed their logo and everything. So he came to our house, he wanted to write a book on agriculture in the tropics. And he mm -hmm. wanted an illustrator. I also draw, actually, my, you know, art started from drawing. Wow. I draw very well, I paint, I even sculpt. I have a stone bust in Massachusetts. So he said, oh, um, if you can do illustration in this book for me, I would love it so much. So I did it for him. 70 images. And then after that, he said, oh, I've been to this house a couple of times and I see you here, young man. What, what do you do? What are you doing in the house? And I said, oh, I finished this for my, wanted to go and do medicine. I couldn't uh, get all my grades to enter medical school. And I'm working for a while to see, you know, what life will do to me. Yeah. Then he said, it looks like there's some art in you, but you've not actually tapped into that. Why don't you decide to do something artistic? So really, well, <laughs> and that was a Saturday. Monday, interestingly, I saw an advert in the newspaper's graphic. Mm -hmm. Ghana firms were looking for people to train in film acting, uh, stage acting. And I said, wow. That time I didn't even know where Ghana firms was. <laughs> I didn't even know uh, what, what, what happened at Ghana firms. So I decided to in those days, walking from Dansoman to Ghana Films. Wow. Yeah, I walked. And this was 1980. Actually, I was doing some stage theater in school, in secondary school, so I decided to just go and find out. And George Ander Wilson, who, may he rest in peace, who was my mentor, was the one who was taking us through the acting. And when I looked at the man, and the way he was talking about acting and how good it was and all of that, he was able to convince me. So... Uh, we were about 150, and they were selecting 40. In fact, um, that audition, I don't know. I sat through the audition right from morning about 9.30. It was about 4.30 getting to 5, and they had finished, and I was still the last person sitting there. Wow. And then the late Kofi Mintz, middle of Mintz, yes. popped out his head and said, Hey, young man, are you coming? Or... Because we finished, we're going. <laughs> then... Upon just a little fraction, I said, okay, I'm coming. So I went. Mr. Ernest Abukwe, Mr. George Andrew Wilson himself, and uh, um, Kofi Mintz, they were the panel. And when they spoke to me for a while, he said, ah, but you, you did science, and <laughs> what have exactly. you got to do with... I said, well, I did science, but I'm also a very good English language student, if it that's what it requires. I was the best English language student in Ghana in 1975. Wow. So, why not? If it is a matter of just using English language, I can speak it very well. If it's a matter of speaking the local language, I can speak it very well. I write poetry in Fante, in Chi. So, why not? <laughs> then I said, oh, okay. Well, you'll, be, you, you'll be selected to you know, um, join the 40 that will be trained here. Wow. I started that training, and from day one, I was the best. We did a short piece of drama called um, Gus, the Theater Cut. Mm -hmm. T.S. Eliot wrote that piece. Uh, they used it as uh, a training material for Guildhall School of Drama in London. Wow. So we did that piece. And that time, um, Uncle Mike Egan had a program on television called uh, Mike Egan Show that he was interviewing, like this Hall of Fame. Yes. Interviewing all kinds of, you know. And because uh, they were interviewing George Andrew Wilson, who was training, training us, he made us take that play, you know, along. I had never been to GBC Studios, and that was my very, very first time of entering GBC Studios. When they did that piece, it's about maybe seven, eight, ten minutes maximum. We did the piece, and then we went and hid behind the curtains in the studio. Then the interview with uh, George Wilson went on, and I've heard um, Uncle Mike Higgins saying, ah, the gentleman who played the lead, I played the lead as Gus, the theater cat. He seems like someone who has good potential for acting. Mm -hmm. is, he, is he good? 
Then Mr. Wilson replied, oh yeah, he's my best student. And when I heard that thing, I said, oh really? Then that finally nails the coffin. I will act. Yes. So I took it up. At that point in time, you had sort of um, found an entry into the, the, or you had made your decision at that point. You could have easily have progressed without any formal training. What led you into deciding to have formal training in the School of Performing Arts? Um, my father was an agriculturist, but he had books on Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, you name them. Mm -hmm. uh, in elementary school, Form 1, Form 2, I had read all those books. And he always told me, if you really want to be any human being in this world, read. So almost all the books in the house, <laughs> and myself and my younger brothers, we were actually competing when we come on holidays. We we'll see who will be able to read as many books as possible before school reopens. Wow. So I was reading and reading and reading, and I read, I can't remember the number of books I've read. And um, so when I found myself in acting and I started acting, I was doing NAFTI student productions, I was doing stage productions. Um, 82, I started television with KTK that became Obra and all of that. Then I realized that, no, a lot of people keep asking, hey, where from this guy? Where, where, how did he just you no know, chance upon this whole industry and he's taking everybody by storm? So I said, no, then it means I have to go and train mm -hmm. and get the real technical know-how to be able to act very well. So um, I did um, Cook Run to Me, and that was 83. Oh. And uh, after Cook Run to Me, I, did, I was doing stage play. So I did a play called Mambo, an adaptation of Macbeth by Professor De Graft. And uh, that won me my first Best Actor Award. Then, 85, we went to World Youth Festival in Moscow. Mm -hmm. But before we went, I decided to apply to go and do drama and theater studies at School of Performing Arts at Legon. So when I returned from Moscow, I, I had received the letter that I had been taken ah. at Performing Arts. Okay. So I went to School of Performing Arts. I initially, I wanted to go and do acting and directing. <laughs> and then the school said, no, in fact, we, we tried it, but uh, we've stopped. We don't you know, teach acting. We don't, people don't graduate here in acting. I said, ah, School of Performing Arts? <laughs> I mean, how can you train everybody in the industry? And the person that we see, rather, you don't read. I felt really sad. I almost dropped out. But I said, no, because I like reading, then what I will do is I will major in playwriting. I'm actually a professional. I'm a playwright. So I took to playwriting. So I majored in playwriting, finished 88. And um, all this while that I was in performing arts, I was acting with talents on stage, I was hosting an at the Art Center. I was doing Obra on television. I was shooting NAFTA students' productions and also into films, by Ghana films and all that. So I was such a busy character. I can imagine. I don't know how I was <laughs> able, able to, to combine. Yeah, go through <laughs> those things because there were times I would go and perform with Obra, arrive in school about 5.30 a.m. And school performing arts, you have to be at school by 6.30 because we do technique before lectures start. And I'll go and do my technique. And when lecture starts, <laughs> I'll start losing. <laughs> it was such an interesting you know, time for me. But I enjoyed it because I loved acting. Hmm. I loved acting. And um, one of my aunties was the one who actually you know, shifted my interest into film. Because um, I remember 1961 or 62 when... Uh, Charlton Heston starred in The Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. You know, I had visited her from Cape Coast. I had visited her in Abakrampa. And the film had come to Abakrampa. And virtually the whole town was going to watch the film. So he said, Ato, show me uncle. <laughs> so I went with her. And when I watched the film, I couldn't decipher the technology that could part the sea for human beings to walk through. Is that real or fake or what? So it tickled my you know, curiosity so much so that 
Every time I watched the film, I wanted to see how they did it. But when I started training with George Wilson, then he told me that, you know, film is actually theater on screen. Mm. Everything that we do is actually theater. Music theater, dance theater, even football is theater. And that's why man, you will tell you, we'll come to the theater of dreams. Ah. Yeah. So he said, if you really want to have anything to do with film, make sure that you train yourself very well in theater because that is where you get all your orientation from. The mentality, <coughs> the retentive memory, the skill to talk, the courage to face audience and all of that. You get it from the theater. If you do, you know, very well in theater, I can assure you, you can do well when you start filming. But fortunately for me, whilst I was training there, I was still doing uh, television and I was you know, doing NAFTI student production. Um, I realized that a lot of people have this mentality about if you cannot make it in life, then you find yourself in this industry to act or to do music or exactly. to dance. And, and I thought that was very silly. And um, that culture grew into the academia. Years back, those who were doing law, engineering, agriculture, and all those things in Legon were calling those who were doing performing arts dondologists. Dondology. And it was because they, they said, <laughs> how can you be playing dondo? And then you put a sign there, silence, <laughs> lectures in progress. <laughs> so they, they were calling them dondologists. And many times over, you know, um, from the grapevine, um, a minister of state in this country had told a minister of culture who was so much interested in, you know, doing something good for the sector. Yes. Virtually screamed at him, why are you pestering me? Oh. I'm drawing budget for the real proper ministries. When I finished, before I come and look at culture, that is the mentality. Oh, wow. And a lot of people will tell you, Oh, concert, no. You know. And because of that, we have never taken this industry seriously. seriously. And I thought, no, that is not right. <laughs> because in Russia, in UK, US, many, you know, Japan, India, they take theater very, very seriously. seriously. Because that is where you showcase who you are in reality. Yeah. How you think, how you feel, how you relate to people. And I, I thought that, no, I must be able to change that thing. So when I entered school performing arts, and I started doing my whatever, I fought to become an ASPA president. That is the school president. And I tried to impress on the school to reintroduce acting because it's not actually good for school performing arts to train everybody, writers, directors, you name them, and then not train actors. It's not right. Uh, I fought and fought and fought. They never, they never agreed and never did. Again, I fought with NAFTI those times when I was, and I realized NAFTI too was not training actors. Oh, wow. I mean, it was actors we see on screen. So fortunately for me, when I left performing arts, maybe about five years or so, school performing arts now reintroduced acting. Initially, they were actually doing only masters in acting. How can you get no. people to come and train in masters in acting when they have not done the bachelor's in acting? But now they have started. Nafti too, they have started. In fact, it was just last three years or so that they called me and whatever. So now I teach acting at Nafti wow. with Ajete Anna. How impressive. Yes. And I realized that because we have not taken this industry seriously, that is why a lot of people will not even encourage their children to come into the to pursue office, careers yeah. in this field. But and that is a very sad commentary on Ghana and the way we think about our culture. We are so proud of so called Ghanaian culture, Ghanaian hospitality. Yeah. How do people see how hospitable you are? If you're not sure, through theater, what you do on television, in film, and things like that. So I, 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 I decided to embark on a one-man crusade to 
bring some sense to the whole system. You cannot push acting or theater or this industry to the background. Absolutely. Because at the end of the day, it's film that promotes tourism. Yep. It's film that sells your economy. It actually, culture is the backbone of the economy. Um, I always say that uh, we've gotten to a time in the history of this country where call any teenager in town, give him 1,000 Ghana to go and shop and follow him to see things that he will buy. None of it is made in Ghana. And that is why the economy is suffering. Because if you go around the world back to get all the money and set up manufacturing concerns and they will make things, and the guy goes to the shop and they have lined up shoes, made in Germany, made in France, made in the US, made in, made in Ghana, you will not even look at the made in Ghana. Go straight into the foreign exactly. industry. Exactly. That is where the problem is. Hmm. And, and on and on and on in what we wear, in the food we eat, in music we listen to, and all of that. And I thought, this narrative must change. Yes. Because if it doesn't change, I'm afraid we will continue to wallow, you know, in this state of affairs for a very long time to come. Because the thing is, it's, it's the psyche, is the way the person thinks. And the work of theater is actually to change the way you think. Yeah. You watch drama, you go through catharsis, and you have a change of mind. Absolutely. And everything you know, starts working new for you. So there are so many things today. I was just running through the graphic as I was waiting to come on this program. And they all the politicians, they all talk and say, oh, so we need to educate the people. You know, we need to let the people have a mind change. We need to have, and I was asking myself, how are they expecting people to have a mind change? When you allow our television to show the cucumbagas and the yeas and the gangas and all those <laughs> things. Now, Kumasi, you go there and girls dress to parties, dress like Indians, <laughs> wearing sari. That is the acculturation that we talk about. And that is the bottom line of the economy because at the end of the day, she wants to buy silk from India. To to wear. Yeah. She wants to do everything, you know, foreign because we place premium on foreign things over and above our own, which is not right. Absolutely. And so for me, I've worked on radio, in television, on stage, and also in film. And I realized that um, we need to have a, a change of mindset for us to be able to get people to start thinking about our mentality, about ourselves. We always talk about the fact that, oh, in Ghana, we are very proud of Ghanaian culture. We are proud of this. We are proud of that. But we are not making any effort whatsoever to get people to really, quote unquote, be that proud. Absolutely. Because <laughs> you, don't, you don't, pride is not sold in any shop. True. You acquire it through training, through upbringing, through whatever you do. And that's what I think theater does. In this country, we don't publish our own language books. And I thought that was, that was a, a misnomer. I don't know how we, because your language has all your philosophy, has the, all your aesthetics, all your norms and ethics and everything about you is in your language. So if you don't learn your language or you don't know your language, I'm afraid you are a, a foreigner in your, in your own country. country. There are a lot of Ghanaian young men and women today who, can't speak who have Ghanaian names, claim they are Ghanaians, don't know anything about Ghana, cannot even speak the language. And that is dangerous. Very dangerous. I always say that. We think that, oh, it's fine, it's normal. Let us not forget that empires have risen, have fallen, and have gone extinct. And Ghana could follow suit. Absolutely. And if you do not take care, by 2050, this country could be recolonized the way we are going. If we do not change the direction we are going as to what to do with our culture, with our language, with our everything, 20, 25, 30 years to come, this country will be recolonized. Because we live not for Ghanaian culture, we live not for Ghanaian ethics, we live not with Ghanaian norms, we live not for Ga anything Ghanaian. But we call ourselves Ghanaians. And <laughs> now that 
Because of you have returned, there are African Americans that are coming in, a lot of them are coming to settle and things like that. <laughs> it's even going to get worse. Hmm. Because we have been trained to easily fall for anything foreign. And that is where the danger lies. And I believe maybe if some people, after, after those, those of us are gone, who will come up and have interest in helping this country really take a critical look at these things, maybe it will change. But if not, all righty. Well, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, uh, even more excitement with the man, David Dontel, who is dropping gems, gem after gem right here on the show. This is Hall of Fame. Don't go anywhere. You're tuned into Hall of Fame right here on City TV. I'm having a conversation with ace actor. I can call, even call him historian, uh, David Donta, who is truly dropping some gems right here on the show. Now, going back into the conversation, and I'll, I'll come back to the culture aspect, because I honestly, yes, I, I'm really excited about and really curious about your thoughts there. But now, on you and your productions, you've done, uh, you've conquered uh, the world of cinema, TV, of, of radio, and as well on stage stage, which productions um, stand out to you in your very amazing career? Many of them. And many of them because every production is a universe. Hmm. It's an entity on its own. Okay. And so a whole lot of other things come into play for a particular production. And especially for me because I also am a writer. When you are writing, you are actually recreating life. Hmm. You are trying to bring into being a life that, is, that doesn't exist. I just finished writing a screenplay that we'll be shooting maybe next week, next two weeks. Wow. And the title is Danfo Alokoto. <laughs> and my assistant who was typing was asking me, what is Alokoto? Yeah. What is, you know? No. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, oh, Alokoto is a game, but I'll show you. I'll let you, you know, see Alokoto. Um, the whole theme of the story is based on Alokoto and the mind behind why we play that game, Alokoto. <laughs> then I also realized that there are a lot of our traditional or local games that we have abandoned. And yet we are always you know, craving to go and play football, yeah. play tennis, play table tennis. Even now, we have arm wrestling yeah. and all of that. And we have wonderful games. I've actually designed a new, what I call, tomato rink. Like the ice skating mm -hmm. rink. Where you climb levels and descend levels, jumping and opening your legs. <laughs> and you must make it in a certain time. Okay. You know, That's to win. That's really exciting. Yeah, fantastic. And I realized that that thing could easily pass for an Olympic game. But we have not looked at it. We have not even thought that is important mm -hmm. for us to develop it. But until we start developing things that we have, <laughs> we'll always be, you know, eating crumbs. Because uh, other countries are seriously pushing a lot of their traditional games into the Olympics. And every now and again, we, we keep hearing, oh, they have reintroduced this new game into the Olympics. They have introduced this new game into the Olympics. And they go and they win all the gold. Exactly, because they're good we'll at go it. And run and we'll, we'll be last, 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 and come. And it's not helping us. So, for instance, if Tumatu is an Olympic game, and Ghanaians are experts in Tumatu, we can go and win gold in Tumatu oh, and come. Constant. And, and things like that. We should start thinking like that until we start thinking like that. So many things will just pass under us and, Absolutely. you know, we will not know where we'll be drifting to. Anyway, in Ghana, we'll do all kinds of realities, music, dance, you know, beauty pageant okay. realities. Nobody. I've actually prepared one, though, if uh, City TV and City FM will help. Perhaps we should. We can actually do a reality show on theater, drama, mm. you know, reality. And I think we should, when we start that, then the kids will now begin to learn the idiosyncrasies of the Ghanaian culture. Things that 
make us Ghanaian. The behavior, the attitudes, the gesturing, the gesticulations, and even the language, the way we speak it and all of that. When we start doing drama as a reality, they'll be forced to consult the old ladies and the old men in the villages, in their homes yeah. and things, to tell them things about our history and our culture and all those things. And they will cooperate it in their dramas. Do you personally... Okay, between theater and TV and movies, which one are you the most comfortable doing? Um, I started with theater. Mm. I'm comfortable doing theater, but... Um, I realized that, uh, you know, because theater is the, is the, is the rudiment, is the basis, the fundamentals of doing anything that has to do with acting. Um, because I picked up from theater, it makes me so comfortable acting for film because I've now known my range exactly. and I play within that range, whether it's television or radio or, you know, film. And so, uh, it's difficult for me, but of course, my first love is theater. Okay. I love theater. Okay. Very much. I'm actually preparing to go and give lecture in about four universities in the U.S. Brilliant. On a theater, new theater art form I have developed. Wow. I, we, we look forward to, to seeing a lot oh, of yes. that. Oh, yes. And I, I believe um, if, if it hits, it will, uh, it will be in the media. Definitely. People, yes. Because they are serious about theater. They actually are interested in seeing new things in theater. And that's what I'm creating. Um, describe the, should I say, golden years of theater here in Ghana, where um, a lot of people were queuing up to see it, and there was a lot more productions going on. And do you think the theater industry in Ghana now has been regulated to the sideline. Is, is, is there enough being done to sort of keep theater alive now in Ghana? <laughs> I will take you from the end. Yes. Seriously, we don't value theater in Ghana. Because if we did, we would have theater in every district, which is. Um, and it's in the UN, you know, declaration on, you know, something about culture. People have a right to see and know and experience their culture through theater. But we have relegated that thing to the background, so nobody even thinks you know, about theater for what, for who, you know, why do we need it? Yeah. But anyone who has been through training to become a teacher, they are taught that the best way to teach a child is through drama. Every teacher will tell you that. And that is why we used to have drama clubs in all the second cycle schools. Yep. Now, where are they? Of course, now, the four years, that became three years, that is two and a half, that is now has become even one year, eight months, <laughs> because of the... <laughs> does not allow for extracurricular activities, because... Yeah. Theatre or anything about culture comes under extracurricular activities. And that's why we are sinking in football, we are sinking in acting, we are sinking in music, we are sinking in everything that has to do with theatre because I won't take my child to school and the two years or two and a half is not even enough for them to finish their syllabus. Yes. How about finding time to go to train, rehearse, to do drama? go to the school field to, to you know, uh, learn athletics or play football or hockey or table tennis. No. I want my child to continue and maybe enter the university or you know, do something else. But those times when you know, there was quite lengthy time for secondary education, people had enough time to do all kinds of things. And all the people at the helm of affairs today, when they were in secondary school, they were experiencing all of that. They should ask themselves, are there kids in school today also experiencing the same thing. Mm. In Ghana, I've started writing one. We do not have theater for children. Most television programs that we, we have in this country are cartoon films from our side, or animation films from our side, or, you know, children's listening from outside. Why don't we do so in Ghana? 
And yet we are the same people who complain that, oh, the kids of today don't respect, they don't behave well, they don't, you know, they dress funnily, they have, you know, shabby way of, you know, they call them nomadic traps. Mm -hmm. People who simply do not even know what lives they are pursuing in life. And it is because we have not taken it upon ourselves, that responsibility of grooming our children through all these things. It's not necessarily even the idea of coming to pursue a career in yeah. this industry as an actor or whatever. No. Now you realize that most of the banks, police service, prison service, they are employing students from performing arts because they have better communication skills. That's true. I can attest to that. I'm a proud product of the oh, School of Performing you see. Arts. You see. <laughs> so, if not for anything, when you get a child trained through theatre, you're actually building the person's future. Because whether you're a doctor or an engineer or agriculturist or anything, you communicate. I like that. You do public speaking. I like that. You do everything that has to do with interaction with human beings. And that's what theatre is all about. Absolutely. So, what is the big deal about it? In, in Scandinavia, when you go through, through the university, and you get your degree in whichever area, you'll be attached to theater for nine months really? to learn teamwork, to learn the discipline of time, to learn the culture, to learn all this. Otherwise, you won't get a job to do. Wow. Uh -huh. This is a country that knows what it means to be serious about theater. I like that. You know. Perhaps we should, we should adopt some parts of that. <laughs> We're going to take another quick break. When we come back, <laughs> even more goodness with David Donto. We're going to be asking him about his views on the quality of movies, TV shows that are coming out now as compared to how it was then. <laughs> and as well, uh, touching a few things as well involved in the movie industry as we know it. Don't go anywhere. This is Hall of Fame. <laughs> I'm having an amazing conversation with the man, David Donto. And going back into the conversation right here on Hall of Fame, I would love to know from you, on the Ghanaian movie industry, I mean, you've seen it develop into what it is now. Um, do you think, uh, or what are your views on the quality? Do you think that quality has improved in recent years or has it diminished in any way or form? Like the accounts would say, it has become to do real well. <laughs> <laughs> we are making a lot more films today, yeah. but about 90% of them don't qualify to be called films. Wow. Yeah. And it has to do with, it starts with a script. Okay. In this industry, whatever you do, if even it's dance, you need to script True. its presentation. And especially with drama, the script plays major role because... You have to have all the elements of drama, as you know, yes. in it. And not only the elements of drama, but the devices you use to really expatiate the theme that you are actually putting across through the play or the drama or the film, whatever. But, and maybe it has to do with the fact that perhaps in Ghana, nobody can live on writing as a profession and, you know, live comfortably. True. And it's sad. Because in the Bible it says it, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word, and the word was, was with God, God, and the, the word, word was God. You cannot develop this industry when you overlook writing or script writing. Because that is where everything starts from. Mm. I always say that the best, three best things to have to make a very good film is the script, very good actors. A very good technical crew. This is what makes a very good film. But it starts from the script. If the script is not good, bring them the Washington and the <laughs> Samuel Jackson and the rest. The film will not fly. Because when you're watching a film and it's so exciting, so interesting, so suspenseful and gripping and all of that, you don't even look at what they are wearing. Whether they are handsome or ugly. That's true. You don't if you if you forget those things. And it is because it's the story that has now seized hold of the person's, you know. Oh, psyche, yeah. Exactly. 
So if the story is not good, forget it. But here we have a situation where, well, I, I hope they are, they are changing. Some of them will go on set with three, four sheets. And we call that the treatment of the story. You know, you've written them down in scenarios. Oh, uh, we're <laughs> uh, no. Ignoring the power of dialogue. The dialogue is the most effective element in drama. Mm -hmm. Apart from facial expression and all of it. So when your script is not good, please don't go there. Mm. I won Best Actor Award for... Uh, no Time to Die, King Ampau, you know, and Wolfgang Panzer, a German, you know, uh, they actually yeah. co-produced and directed that film. Yeah. It took them four years to write the script. Four yeah. years to write the script. And that's no wonder it won an award because the story was solid, perfect, virtually. We are not writing good scripts, especially in these days. Apart from Shelley uh, and a couple of other people, yeah. we are not writing good scripts at all, which is very bad. True. Sure. You know, added to that is also the fact that a lot of actors, you know, enter into film untrained. Of course, there are people who are naturally talented and, you know, so bring that natural talent to bear on whatever they do. But even that is not enough. Talent is talent. Okay. It has to be polished into skill. Do you feel... Okay, so in, in these days, there are a lot more people, or there seem to be a lot more people on paper who are actors as compared to um, earning their stripes and getting the kind of training. Does it bother you as someone who has truly earned his stripes, been through it, trained uh, with the best and become the well-rounded actor that you are, that people are focusing more on the glam than actually putting in the work. Exactly so. I, I don't know what people think about seeing the best of the latest flashy cars, <laughs> the, the most beautiful mansions, the best of couture, or whatever. Yeah. That does not make the drama. Yes, they are beautiful. But if the story behind all that beauty is hollow, everything falls through. It doesn't get anywhere. Because I went for uh, a film festival in New York, uh, African International Diaspora Film Festival. Yeah. As a special guest, because they were showing four films that I featured in at the festival. Sad to say, there was one Ghanaian film, I won't mention the name of, of the film, mm. that was part of the four films that were shown. That, when it was being produced, they thought that, Oh, it has all the glamour, all the this, all the that. The, the women were wearing human hair and all <laughs> of that. Guys were riding motorbikes, you know, and all. But that was a film that they ran down, pathetically ran down. That wow. Film that doesn't qualify to even be at the festival. I was so ashamed. So, so ashamed. Yet this is a film that has all the glamour you can think of. But glamour doesn't make fun. True. Love root. What is the glamour in love root? <laughs> what is the glamour in Kukran to me? There's no time to die. You should see it. Well, there's no glamour in it. Yet these are the films that we now watch because they portray who you are. True. They portray, you know, what we do, they say, as you know, uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, 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 bringing you know, something close to reality, you know, trying to come that close to reality. That's what we try to do. Close to which reality? We live in a certain cultural milieu that has all kinds of things. That's what the world wants to learn. The world, the world does not want to know about how good you are at speaking the English language or how good you are at wearing the Giorgio Armanis and the Versaces yeah. and the, no. That's, the world is not interested because they know it's not your culture. Do you think there have been enough policy direction to sort of protect those that started off? I know recently the Creative Arts, uh, the Minister for Tourism and Creative Arts announced a, a fund, sort of a Creative Arts fund, sort of 
take care of veterans. Do you think policy direction in general in recent times have benefited the movie industry as a whole? Not yet. Not yet in the sense that um, as a country, we, as I speak, over 60 years as a country, as an independent country, yeah. we do not have a firm, you know, act that incorporates our policy on film. Mm. It was passed. 2016 was assented by the president then. So today as we speak, it's not operational because the legislative instrument that will make it operational, I'm on the committee doing it. And I'll use this opportunity to appeal to our legislators. It's very important for us to pass or to expedite the passing of the legislative instrument on the Film Act. Because when that is done, that is when we'll be able to impress on the world what Ghanaianism or what the Ghanaian culture is all about. And to go a long way to inform and promote our tourism and also our economy. Until we start doing that, we will always be playing second fiddle to other cultures. Mm. Because if that act is operationalized, it will be difficult for a television station to show more than 30% of foreign material because it prescribes 70% local material, 30% uh, foreign material. Why do we have old actors? And we still paint people's hair to play you know, elderly are they, are you getting enough calls? Do people are people beating down your door, reaching out to you oh, to do productions? You know what they used to say? What? Hey, David, don't do you can't pay him more. Eesh. That guy he even takes dollars. Wow. That is not true. No Ghanaian producer in this country has ever paid me in dollars. And you know, the fees that the so called celebrities that we have in acting take, I don't even take half. Mm. But they won't come. Because they are not comfortable working with you. Because you will tell them to do the right thing. And why not? Because I will not attach my reputation with anything that will run, run down my, my reputation that I've acquired over the years in acting. So they, some of them bring me scripts. And because I did, you know, playwriting, yeah. I read through the script and I realized that there is nothing in the script and I just drop it somewhere. <laughs> An actor has a right to accept to play in the production or not. That is why there's audition. Mm. And that is why you, the producer will discuss with you and everything, whether you accept to play in it and then agree with you how much you will take, blah, blah, blah. People must have the guts to tell producers, this script, I'm not interested. Mm. You know, you don't just put anything out there and call it a script, no. Now, quickly also touching, uh, you earlier spoke about the year of return. What are your views on the whole concept and the execution of the year of return? Fantastic concept. Mm. But ask me, we have not done one production okay. on the year of return. Wow. On television, on stage, and even film. I'm actually writing a story <laughs> about African Americans who set off from America, you know, to come back for the so-called year of return. And the drama on the ship. They, they came by ship. The drama on the ship. You know. And this is a huge blockbuster film. You really have a very good script, very good actors, very good crew. It will be like Black Panther. Mm -mm. But we don't think about these things. Stage production. You do a huge stage production on Nagbewa, Sumela Nduru, Dakpa, or Dida Kaibi, or Yasantua, or Setutu, or whatever, and put it on stage at National Theatre. These guys who are coming, they would want to see. They would want to see. These are their heroes. They have not, they don't have any idea of how they look like, or how they lived, or the cultures they you know, grew up in, and things like that. Okay. You know, we are all interested in getting them to go and visit Cape Coast Castle, Mina Castle, Kakum, and then they go away. They bring money, they can't spend, and they take the money back. Engage them. Engage them with productions, mm. with performances, dance theater, music theater, drama theater. 
Let them, and that is it's a culture they understand from where they're coming. And you can do they it, will yeah. pay if you ask him to pay 200, 300 Ghana cities to come and watch cutting edge theater. They will pay and come and watch. Would you consider um, a role in politics in the near future? I'm a political animal, like mm. every human being. Yes. So um, if it meets me along the way of my life, why not? I'm ready to serve my country. Because mm. that's what I do on screen and on stage and on television. So if politics come to me, I'm, 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 I'm a dramatist. I write, direct, produce, and act. But people forget that. All what we do is about life. Drama is a slice of life put on stage, as you know. So I understand life. And I know so much of the ramifications of politics as it, in, in how it operates socially. Because I deal with human beings. I, I play politicians. I play all kinds of yep. human beings. And so if it's politics, I understand politics. For any aspiring um, creative who might be tuned in, who's looking to find a foot in the door, get through to either do TV, radio, film, or theater, or perhaps even art, uh, what would you tell that person on how to be the very best version of themselves that they can be? If you are a creator, you are a child of God. Mm -hmm. That is the best God could expect of a human being. To be able to recreate. That is why we procreate. To be able to recreate life. Make life beautiful. Make life comfortable. So if you have an inkling, you have a feeling, you have just a little something for creativity, please do very well to pursue it. You will not be throwing away your good life or good time. It is very good for every citizen to have a, a certain element of creativity in you. Of course, of course, a human being, you know, naturally is creative because we are the only reasoning animals. Please, whether it's in the visual arts or in the literary arts or in the performing arts, it's good for you. Pursue it. But don't just pursue it not knowing anything. Don't be an ignoramus in the industry. Tutor yourself. Polish your talent into skill. Train. Get to know and understand how it is done and done well so that you can compete with anything or anyone across the world. But on a lighter pleasure. note, uh, social media went a gang when we found out that you were an it couple with someone we also absolutely love, Grace Marble, um, a few years, a while, a while back. And we didn't even realize, I didn't even realize that you were an it couple then. Uh, uh, what couple? And uh, well, a couple, you were together. You and Grace Marble were together. I, I didn't even realize that at a point in time. Uh, on a very lighter note, um, how was it being a, a sh can I call it a celebrity couple back then or being together at that particular point in time? It, actually, uh, people didn't understand that relationship. Okay. You know, um, whether on stage or on television or even in films, we were playing husband and wife mm -hmm. because there was a certain synergy mm -hmm. that worked between us. And it was not for anything. In fact, for the so many years that we appeared on television, we never kissed even once. Huh. Yes. But it was because of the synergy, the relationship, the way we... Everybody, when I go to Europe, they say, hey, but, I'm not going to <laughs> but we never married. Hmm. We never, you know... Uh, of course, we, we were very good friends. Okay. And anything happens between very good friends. Hmm. So... That answers the question. <laughs> <laughs> Very big. I like it. Thank you so much, David, for coming here. My this has pleasure. been an amazing conversation. Thank you. And thank you for being tuned in. I hope you've been able to see the absolutely brilliant man that David Donto is and hoping to see all the incredible things he's about to put out and maybe read his memoirs sometime soon to come. Uh, this has been another exciting edition of Hall of Fame. Special thanks to Yvola Jewelry for my jewelry and first choice for my hair. And thank you for being tuned in. We'll be back next week, Saturday, for another exciting edition of Hall of Fame. And until then, keep watching City TV.